We're here at the Puro CDR Summit um, in New York, um, a part of the New York Climate Week. And we've got uh, basically every single part of the um, CDR ecosystem uh, represented over here. And uh, I think there's a lot of learning and sharing happening right now. Carbon removal is all about collaboration. Uh, there are different kinds of players, the investors, the certification bodies, the verifiers, the uh, marketplaces, um, various advisors. So there needs to be a smooth sort of uh, value generation uh, between these uh, players. And there's been a time when there's been more divergence. Now we're seeing sort of specialization and people concentrating on the areas that they know their best. Uh, that's a very uh, encouraging sign. It, it's interesting. I mean, you all are here. We're all here, right? Uh, talking about CDR in a way that, you know, certainly a decade ago, this wasn't happening. And even the fact that we have a CDR team was like unthinkable like three years ago, right? And now it's one of the fastest growing segments of our institute. For me, it was really exciting to see um, not just the number of companies that were founded, but also the breadth of solutions and the breadth of the types of technologies that are being deployed. And I think in particular, that thousand ton demonstration scale is really needed to figure out, you know, which of these technologies actually work in the real world and how can we get to that eventual gigaton scale. Black and brown, low income individuals came up with the working definition of what they meant by environmental justice. And it literally means making a safe place and making sure that the benefits outweigh the harms for people who live, work, pray, and worship in different areas. Two of the category criteria out of six are about uh, environmental justice and climate justice. Well, your project must have a plan about how you are engaging with the community. And it should be designed in a way that is going to be cascading benefits towards marginalized communities. What's needed in the space is the whole portfolio. Even if we planted every surface of the planet with trees, it wouldn't be enough. So having a balanced portfolio of both engineered, durable, nature-based, high co-benefits is the approach that I've always taken a view of and I think is what's needed in the space. I think we really have to educate um, the market in the sense that the time to get in line really is today and also buyers have to start developing the commercial contractual relationships today that they can then tap into and grow over time. Despite the prolonged economic uh, downturn, climate technology investments and private markets have actually tripled since 2019. So between 2019 to 2022, there's a lot of reason for optimism and there's a lot of reason to gain, continue gaining investor interest, especially in the type of purchase agreements for, that we do. We're really as um, agents of change, hopefully, for large swathes of uh, regulated insurance capital to come in and help you all because really we're enablers in this space uh, to really help you do the job that you need to do. Why did we start our carbon removal program? Easy. We really wanted to kind of change the world in a positive way. We saw the need for carbon dioxide removal technologies to get started and to grow. We were very excited about how biochar could play a major role in that, largely because these technologies are ready to scale today and they have some of the lowest price points uh, per sequestration of carbon of any other technology out there. So we really felt like we could get started quickly and be able to build to very large scale at probably the least cost of any technology out there. I've been in the biochar world for five years and it was a whole other world before carbon removal. We need all of the solutions, but we also need to accelerate them because unlike other issues, there is a clock ticking in this challenge that we're facing. 90% of carbon removals are in the northern hemisphere and not in the south. So right now we're developing the south and I hope that's going to follow by other projects in the future. We hope that with your support, you know, you, you the buyers, we can only not, our project can not only achieve its goals, but it can also evolve, thrive, and create even bigger milestones because at the end, this is not just for Bolivians, but it's for all of us. We couldn't say climate change. And so here we are actually coming forward with real solutions that um, is getting real backing, there's real markets, and real activity is happening. So for me, it's, uh, it's kind of a dream to be here, and I really appreciate that. We are trying to prove a business model and demonstrate a market that can be replicated many times over throughout the West. Thank you, Puro. I don't think this journey would have been possible without you guys. We're doing 
this for the, the first time, as far as I know, in the world. And uh, if you haven't heard about us so far, I think you'll, you'll hear about us in the coming months and years. And it's probably the number one question that we get from buyers, certainly that you guys get from buyers, is like, you know, wood can be used for stuff. Why would you put it in a hole and walk away from it? Um, you know, one thing that may not be that intuitive to folks on the East Coast is that out in the Intermountain West where we operate, um, dead wood is actually the fastest growing forest carbon sink. Out here in California, what we've seen in conversations with experts and you know, real world situations is that most of the wood waste from forest thinning is pile burned or shipped and left in the forest. So the, it's non-merchantable, the utilization pathways aren't keeping up with the volume of waste that's being produced. We committed to uh, being net zero in 2030, which means two things basically. The first is to reduce our emissions intensity in half by 25 versus 2018 where we started. And the second is to transition those carbon crates, um, half avoidance today, half removals, to 100% removals in 20, 2030. So we have the interim target to retire 2.2 million tons of CDL by 2030. And this our commitment comes from the sense of the urgency because there is a limited remaining carbon budget and we as the industry wish to contribute to scale of the CDL market so that we can ensure the sufficient supply when we need, when we need it in 2050. There's a major gap in the market for this new type of approach that we need, which is CDR, carbon dioxide removal, using technology. Um, what do we do as a company that's been involved in the, in the carbon markets for 17 years and has really been a promoter of how to incentivize and promote climate action and finance to, to advance these, these types of activities? To scale this industry to gigaton scale by 2050 and doing so with the highest trust and the highest quality. And we believe we have found in, in Auntie you and, and your team at Puro the right partner to, to make this goal and this vision come true. We would definitely like to see more financiers um, supporting CDR projects, as well as independent MRV and better ways of measuring the removals. We would also like to see more partnership with low buyers as well as no buyers entering the market. Most importantly, I'd like to highlight that our process mineralizes carbon, leading to high permanence. But unlike other means uh, of carbon removal, it also scales very quickly. So to put it simply, with ERW, you get the all-important permanence of a tech-based carbon removal approach with the scalability of a nature-based approach. Essentially what we do is we crush it and mix different types of slags to adjust the chemistry for different use cases. Um, those are crushed to a size spec, transported in trucks to the job site, and spread uh, to make gravel roads. The amazing thing is that these gravel roads start to soak up CO2 on day one. No extra energy inputs required uh, because of the nature of the steel slag. So we really want to bring the carbon dioxide removal space and every technology that we we come across. We want to bring it to the next level. We want to bring it from a wonderful idea that can potentially uh, reach funding. We want to bring this to the legitimacy scale that it's going to take to actually uh, to grow into a, <clears throat> a climate changing uh, technology. Our reason for supporting carbon removal and for venturing into this world had a lot to do with the fact that when we became a publicly traded company, we also made a statement that we wanted to be a 100-year company. And if you're going to operate on a time horizon 100 years from now, the world is going to be very different than it is today. And one of those things that's going to be a threat to our business if we don't deal with it is climate change. The luxury of being able to help scale the carbon removal market so that we have removals down the road when those net zero targets hit. And you know, we're not just gonna be able to turn on all the DAC plants that manage, <laughs> just magically appear. We have to scale them and support them today. So that's why we're focusing our efforts there, because we can. And the way that I think we think about it internally is where there's a gap in what needs to happen to meet our climate goals, that's a gap that we feel like we can fill. Um, the truth, you know, it's true for nature and our work on nature, um, and it's true for carbon removal. It's a space that 
needs acceleration and we have a lever that we can exercise in order to accelerate that market. For Microsoft, I we think of this more of a responsibility, not just to the planet, but also to our customers. Those who can move faster and farther should do it. And um, that kind of tells you what, why Microsoft made the big <laughs> commitment to go carbon negative by 2030. When we look for projects, we kind of use three different lenses of how we're evaluating. So we're looking for things that hit our approach criteria, um, execution, and portfolio. So. Uh, execution, is this a team that can do what they said they're proposing to do? Portfolio, are we building a risk-adjusted portfolio of solutions that we think will get us to what we need in 2030 and beyond? Thank you to the many, many suppliers in this room. Um, you guys are doing the, the really hard work of actually building the thing, and, and so you know, we get to sit up here and tell you how we think about it, but you guys are doing the real work, so um, thank you. This level of, of standardization and, and you know, codification of, uh, of, of removal activities, this is absolutely critical for us in the market just to make that easier, build trust on, on standards that you then don't have to diligence individual projects. As we look to kind of expand to that next rung, right, and uh, to continue to find these buyers, you know, making it easy, uh, providing them portfolios, providing them climate expertise, you know, things that we've been able to do to, to try and crack that ice, it's just so important to continue to find those efficiency of the scale and get more of those players to the table uh, to make those commitments. Carbon removal offers something that I don't think a lot of other offsets or, or carbon credits do, which is the potential for really robust additionality and permanence. And that has been the downfall of so many other carbon crediting efforts that have come before it. And so if we can show people that these are in fact really permanent, really additional and that there's supply out there, that really gets folks off the fence, largely on the risk side. But what we hope to do with that purchasing program is to show that this is not just a voluntary corporate effort. It's something that governments around the world need to be doing and that we need to expand the set of purchasers in the field a lot. We actually have uh, a very robust portfolio management system that's handling billions of environmental credits today. With API connectivity, which is a technology that the U.S. financial system runs on, connecting the registries to the markets. It won't come just thanks to new IT stuff. It won't come just thanks to honest project developer or honest clients. The reality is really the relation between the clients, the corporates, and the projects and this is a bridge that we are trying to set up just to make sure that it's not just something happening somewhere else, but it's really something that you can get in front of you, you can be part of it. Carbon removal is not only forecast to be over a trillion dollar market, it's also what is required in order to meet any of the climate scenarios for hitting 1.5 degrees at a scale that's even bigger than the oil and gas industry is today. And right now the technology is at their infancy, which is why we need all the help we can get building new innovations that are removing carbon in a durable, safe, transparent, and a way that benefits communities. And this is why we focus a lot on investing in the innovations that are building it.